since we are talking about or going to talk about JPA, I'd like to know who's already using JPA. That are most of you. So why are you here? Oh, I know. You don't use Spring Data JPA. So, so who is using Spring Data JPA? Not everybody. Okay. Before I start with the real talk, I would like to start with a little story. From back in the days, in the 70s of the last millennium, the last 70s of the last millennium, when I was a little kid, BMX bikes were all the rage. You had to have a BMX bike. Everybody knew that except our parents. So we had normal kid bikes. But the good thing is, well, for, at least for a kid, what really is a BMX bike? It's a normal bike without all the extra stuff. So one afternoon, we started to take our bikes apart, ripped off the lamps, took off the porter. I actually chiseled off the little metal plate where the porter is screwed to the frame because it still weights a couple of grams, right? And you have to get rid of that. Um, Mudguard, gone. And then there was this little thing on the axle this one right here, it didn't seem to have any purpose. So I went to the workshop of my dad, got a little metal saw out and sawed that thing off and removed the screw from the frame and bang, there I had my BMX bike. And I took it for a ride on the nearby parking lot and everything went just fine until at the end of the parking lot, right before the bushes, I tried to brake. And I hit the coaster brake and exactly nothing happened, except that I got airborne and landed like two meters behind the bushes. So what was happening? Well, this thing here is actually called a torque support. And it's an important part of the coaster brake because the coaster brake basically couples this part of the axle, which is attached to the rim, to the inner part of the axle in here. But that doesn't do any good because in a bike this is just kind of clamped to the frame and it will turn with the wheel without any problem. In order to prevent that, you have the torque support, which ties all this to the frame and keeps it from turning. And since I removed that, my coaster brake wasn't basically non-existing anymore. So what does have this maybe funny little story to do with the JPA and Spring Data JPA? Well, as part of my job, working at the Spring Data team, being responsible for Spring Data JPA and Spring Data JDBC, I monitor Stack Overflow for Spring Data JPA questions. And my impression is they are basically working, or many people are working in a similar way that I was working back as the kid. Or as it is described in the Bible, they just don't know what they are doing. So you are laughing, so I guess that means that you are not one of those. But um, even if you are, you're here, so we're going to change that. First thing to understand about Spring Data JPA is it's built on JPA. Wow, big surprise. So in order to use it, you have to understand JPA. Unfortunately, that is not as easy as it might seem from like beginner's tutorials of JPA. Um, so we will look at a very simple example, but then ask some tricky questions that should make clear how JPA works and why it sometimes gets a little confusing. Oh, and one person before the talk approached me and like, I want to see if you can convince me that JPA is a good thing because I really hate it. That is not my plan. Um, I want you to understand how JPA works if you don't know that already. And also how Spring Data JPA works and what it can do for you. If you want to do the right thing from an architectural uh, point of view, um, come to my talk on Thursday about Spring Data JDBC. Much better. 
But on we go, JPA. JPA is all about persistence. Basically, you have tables in your database and you have entities in your Java application. And these Java um, classes have to be JPA entities. And you get that by annotating them with entity. And then you also have uh, the attributes, which also get all kinds of annotations to tune how these are get mapped to the table or tables. An important one is the ID. Basically, every entity needs one to identify it. Another one is the version, um, which is used for optimistic locking. You probably uh, want to have that most of the time as well. And you can have simple attributes that don't need any annotation and just get mapped uh, to a matching column. And then you have more complex stuff like one-to-one, -one, many to one, um, and others that need a couple of annotations to really specify what you want Hibernate or Eclipse Link, which are the dominant implementations of JPA to do. So let's assume we have an entity like this, and let's assume uh, generation type auto for the ID uh, basically means it depends on the database how and where the ID is generated. For the following example, um, assume that the ID of the person actually gets set in the client. So when you create a person object, you set the ID. And then code might look like this to actually work with this. You get an entity manager, just abbreviated EM up here. You create a person and you call entity manager dot persist, which should save the person in the database, I guess. And then you can use, for example, a method like find to get your person back out of the database. You pass in the ID, you pass in the type of object that you're looking for, and you get it back. Um, alternatively, if you don't like if you have uh, more complex queries, um, you can do something like this. Again, entity manager, create a query based on a JPQL query. Again, specify what kind of object you expect, set the parameter, and get, in this case, a single result back. Should, again, return the same person, right? But I have put in, as comments, three places up here after calling persist after finding the entity, and down here after querying it. Um, and I want you to imagine that there I look into the database um, with a SQL query, for example, by using the JDBC template of Spring. What kind of result would I get on these three, place, place, oh, three places? What do you think? Always one? One, one, one? Who thinks that is the right answer? Not many. So what else? What else could it be? I, I save it. There should be an, ent an entry in the database, right? And it shouldn't change because I only read. Zero on all three? Come again? Yeah, there's, there's some truth in there. But you all use JPA and you feel scared to answer this question. This is weird, right? Well, the answer is actually, it will return zero in the first place, zero on the second, and one in the third place. Why the heck is that? The reason is that, as you already hinted at, JPA does something like uh, called delayed writing. It tries to write data to the database as late as possible. That means the persist call up at the top doesn't actually persist anything. It actually might do an insert statement if it needs to do that in order to determine the ID of the entity. Like if you have a, a serial column which creates the ID on insert, that statement will actually perform an insert. But if you don't, and I claimed that we set the ID in the person object manually on the client side, you don't get anything. It just remembers, OK, you have this entity here. 
eventually I have to flush it through the database. But then I call find. That's for sure going to query in the database, right? No, again, because the entity manager works as a first level cache. And if you do a find operation, it looks into that cache, finds out, oh, for that ID, I already have the entity, so I don't have to ask the database. So I get, again, directly that entity returned without any interaction to the database. But then why do I get a change in that with the query? Well, the problem with the query is JPA doesn't really know what's going to happen. It doesn't know what you're going to query, and it actually has to send that query to the database. And in order to make sure that you actually see a consistent set of information from what you just did in your entity manager session, it actually flushes out all the changes to the database. So this is why you get a one in the late uh, in the last position. And this kind of delayed writing is kind of cool because it allows JPA to combine statements and batch them if you configure it correctly, but it can become really, really, really confusing if you do something that JPA didn't anticipate and you get weird results and an audience that uses a technology and doesn't really um, trust themselves to answer a simple question like, when does the insert happen? So that was on the right side of things. It continues. Um, what about this method here? We have a, uh, a person service, which is annotated as transactional spring annotation. So everything, all methods in there, um, start a transaction, close that transaction afterwards. Um, we auto wire the entity manager and we have a set name method which takes the ID of a person and the new value for the name and then it finds that person and sets the first name. No passes, no save, no merge, nothing in there. If I actually use that, sorry, wrong slide. If I actually use that method and call from a service set name, what will happen? Will my database state change or not? Who thinks the database will change? Okay, that's like a quarter. Who think it doesn't change? That's even less. And lots of people which are, again, unsure what's going to happen. And I think you had the answer. Exactly. Assuming that it gets called from a non-transactional context, um, the transaction will start when entering set name and the transaction will end after it when it leaves that method. And again, JPA does something really tricky. If you load an entity, it kind of keeps connected to that entity and it tracks all the changes to that entity. So the entity manager knows that you changed that entity and at the end of the transaction will flush these changes to the database. So you don't have to call save or persist or merge or anything like that. Which again is cool because it saves a statement and is not cool at all if you want things like you changed an entity but then don't want to persist it um, or this kind of stuff. It will. There are obviously there are ways around it, but then it starts get complicated. So this is really important to understand. The entity manager keeps a connection to the entities as long as the transaction is open and tracks all the changes and flush, flushes them out to the database. So basically the second strike um, or second point for confusion on the right side. Now look at the read side. There's actually, there was uh, another little method in here, load person, which just find a person by ID and returns it. Now, if I use it like that, what do you think will happen? 
Notice this is outside the transaction, that's the important part. Any ideas? Exactly, you will get uh, a lazy loading exception. Um, question is, where? Pardon? Second line on over here on get address? Yeah, either second or third. <laughs> well, one, one of the three lines throws an exception. <laughs> it's exactly right, it's the third line. Get address will actually, the address will get loaded eagerly by default as when uh, you config, configure the entity um, as described earlier on. Um, the hobbies won't. They will get loaded um, lazily. And what might be even more interesting, the get hobbies over here, this one, that doesn't trigger an exception. What triggers the exception is the for each because the get hobbies will basically return a proxy collection, which just knows, well, I have to get these hobbies, um, but it doesn't actually do it. It only does it when you try to iterate over them or otherwise try to access them. So the for each actually will try to access the database. We'll notice the transaction is already closed. I don't have basically an entity manager anymore that can load the entities for me and throw an exception. <laughs> the exception is actually not that big of a problem because you will notice that during testing, the bigger issue behind that is even if you're in a transaction, these statements will trigger SQL uh, statements to be executed at some point of time that is basically for an average developer impossible to tell in advance. Is it at get address? Is it at get hobbies? Or only when I iterate over them? Which might lead to situations where your application performs nicely and then someone does a tiny change somewhere, maybe adding a little field in, in some web form and showing an, another attribute, and suddenly additional SQL statements get executed and performance plummets. Because you have to realize a normal method call should be form, which like a normal getter, which does nothing. Um, the time used for that should be somewhere in the range of nanoseconds. A round trip to the database is probably more in the range of milliseconds or tens of milliseconds, which still doesn't sound like that much, but it's thousand times or 10,000 times more than the call that I expected. And then that can make a huge difference and I think it's really a problem that you can't see that in your code where it is going to happen. The people experienced with JPA uh, therefore recommend that you keep the log open um, for your SQL statements all the time so that you see what SQL statements get executed. There are actually libraries out there that test that the expected number of SQL statements get executed so that you get an exception with that suddenly changes. But again, while these tools are helpful and I recommend their use as well, it's um, at least problematic that uh, you can run into these problems just by not knowing how to properly use this stuff. But again, now you know. So this is the basics of JPA. You have entities, you load them, they are kept in this first level cache. You can manipulate the, them. And at the end of a transaction, JPA makes sure all the changes get flushed to the database. So what does Spring Data JPA do for you? The first thing to notice is it's not a replacement for Spring Data JPA. It's an add-on. It's there to make your work with JPA nicer and easier, to take away some of the tedious stuff that you otherwise might have to do. Um, it's not a replacement, means also you still have to know JPA and you still have uh, will work with stuff like Criteria RP, which is an, an API to um, create queries or JPQL, which is basically the replacement for SQL uh, within JPA. 
The first thing Spring Data JPA makes really easy are CRUD operations. Create, read, update, delete. All you need to do after adding Spring Data JPA to your dependencies is define a repository like this. It's just an interface. It inherits from, in this case, JPA repositories. There are um, a couple of options like CRUD repository if you don't need anything specific to JPA. And there are no methods in there. There is no implementation that you need to provide. This is done by Spring Data JPA itself. And you can inject a repository into your application wherever you want. And then you can save persons, or you can find them, or you can delete them, or count them, or uh, check if they exist. This kind of stuff. Really straightforward. Um, I guess also not much of a deal if you end that functionality. You probably would be able to do that with an entity manager directly. But it's certainly nice to not have that. The big point about this repository is, or like a really common question about that is, do I need a repository for each and every entity in my application? And the very clear answer is no. You don't need a repository for every entity. You need a repository for every aggregate, or to be more precise, for every aggregate root. If these terms confuse you, um, you have basically two options. Either you look them up uh, in a book or on the web under domain-driven design, because that's where these concepts come from. Um, or you come again to my talk on Thursday, where I will talk about that in way more detail. The short version is an aggregate is a cluster of entities that should get handled as one thing all the time. The classical example would be an order which always goes with its order IDs or order items, especially an order item on its own. Without an order, it doesn't really make sense, right? So the order would get a repository. The order items would not. You would load them through the order repository and then navigate to them um, from the order. Um, the products on the other side pretty much probably have a lifetime or life cycle apart from a very separate from the order. So they are their own aggregate. Um, and that's the basic idea. The next thing, and possibly the one that is most famous from the Spring Data JPA features is query derivation. It works like this. Again, you go back to your person repository and you add methods like this find by first name. And if you look at a name find by first name, you probably in your head know what this is going to do, right? It's going to query the database for persons that have the name given as a parameter. And this is exactly what Spring Data JPA will do for you. Spring Data JPA can handle um, more complex queries this way. For example, uh, another example would be exist by address city contains ignore case. If you look at that name, you probably also can figure out what that means. It navigates or it creates a where clause which basically navigates uh, across the address to the city and checks if the parameter value given is contained in the name of the city um, by ignoring upper and lower case. But already here you see a very important limitation of query derivation. It's only intended for really simple queries. This is kind of, I think the exist variant, uh, this example, already shouldn't be used because the method name is not a nice name. Um, but find by first name, no, there's no reason why you should implement that by hand. Um, you can let Spring Data do that. And again, you can use that just as one would think one uses that. Um, if you are wondering why a rest is there, um, the first time I gave this talk was in Bucharest, so that query would actually check uh, 
if someone is in from Bucharest in the database. So if query derivation isn't for all queries, what is? Well, the next level of complexity would be annotated queries. Again, we go to the repository. And now we add a query annotation um, to our method. And the query annotation or the query given there can be either a JPQL query, like this one, um, it can also be a SQL query. We would need another attribute in the query annotation, uh, marking it as a native query. And we can also do what I did here. Um, normally, if we want to use the parameter in the query, we would just use it with a colon. So as something like where a city like colon city. But in this case, I want to do a little more complex stuff. And in this uh, hash curly braces is um, a spell expression. So the way how this works, it, it takes the city parameter, check if it's null or if it's an empty string. And if that is the case, it just uses the percentage sign. And otherwise, it uses whatever was given as the parameter of string. So this is basically a way to um, load a string constructed here in the select clause um, and define a where clause where you can either have it for all um, values in the database if you provide no string at all or an empty string, or you can filter it again by a like query if you provide a value for city. And you can do all kinds of stuff with that. One thing that is kind of tricky to do or next to impossible with this straight away is pagination. Um, you could do it if you use SQL statements, but in JPQL, pagination is actually not done in the, J in the, the JPQL query. It's done on the API level. So you can't do that because you're not accessing any entity manager. But there's a solution for that, which is basically that you can uh, move from a query like that to something like that, where you just add a pageable argument and then you probably want to return a page instead of a list. And this will do pagination for you. So you have um, the pageable contains information like which page do you want, first, second, third, and how big your pages should be. And the page itself then uh, will contain the appropriate number of results and um, uh, ways to access the next page, the previous page. And very important, it also contains a count of all persons which sometimes can be an exp uh, expensive query. And if you don't want that, there are simple ways to solve that. You just return a slice instead of a page. A slice is very similar to the page. Basically, the only difference is it doesn't have this total number of elements. And since it, since it doesn't have that, it doesn't get queried for, for in the database. Um, so as it saves a query that you might not need. And uh, if, you, um, if you don't even need like this, this next page and previous page and want to use the pageable just as a way to limit the number of results, you can even return just a list and it would work just as fine. There's a question. Yeah. Um, the, the question was basically, um, with this mechanics, it does basically an offset, which is both um, 
not optimal performance wise and also has the problem if I query for a page then somebody enters an element into the database that would go into that page and if I then go to the next page I would basically get elements twice or otherwise skip elements and funky stuff like this happens. This is an inherent problem with uh, pagination done like this. There's a, a technical better approach where you basically uh, don't say um, I want elements 50 to 70, but I want all the I want the next 20 elements after this element. Um, this is a known technique. It's not implemented in Spring Data yet. Um, so I know there is an issue open up there, and the unfortunate thing is there are many open issues. And it didn't make it up to the front uh, yet, but um, it's something that uh, actually is rather interesting to do. But so right now, we don't offer that, unfortunately. So the next thing are projections. Um, JPA entities can become very complex with lots of attributes, lots of references to other entities, and often you don't need that if you query. Maybe you want a certain kind of report, an overview, where you only have a couple of attributes that you want to display or that you need to use. And in that case, projections, projections are for you. Again, you take your repository and you take a query like this, which we already had, and change it to something like this. The important part is that I'm now returning a simple person. What that kind of class is, we'll look at it a little later. Another thing to notice is between the find and the by, there's this simply. This is actually completely ir irrelevant for what is, uh, what is happening on the query side. It's only a way to separate this query from the one before that, which would have otherwise the same name. And actually in my example code, this is all in one repository and wouldn't compile if it has the same name. So you can use that in many cases where your method actually looks the same but you want to have um, different mechanics behind that by having different annotations at them. Um, you can use uh, anything or put anything between the find, which defines the kind of query that gets executed, and the by, which basically prefixes your, your conditions for query um, derivations. So let's look at the simple person. The simple person is just an interface that offers some, but not all, of the attributes of the original entity. And it also has uh, the get address method, which has this value annotation. And again, in this value annotation, we use a spell expression. Notice, again, it starts with hash, curly braces, and ends with a curly brace. And you have a spell expression in there, which basically assembles a string from different attributes. With a projection like this, um, we will still load the complete entity and uh, create a proxy implementing this interface. Um, so you have the, the nice limited interfaces that only offers the information that you need at that point. You're still performing the full query. If you don't need stuff like this with a value annotation, if you just pick a couple of attributes that you want to use in your projection. We actually try to limit the query to only the columns and attributes that you're actually requesting. An important thing to understand there is that we try to ask JPA to only query the columns that we need. But in many cases, JPA implementations actually ignore that and they are free to do that according to the specification and still query more than we actually want. That's nothing we can change. There's another question. Um, 
I actually don't know. I would have to look into the JPA uh, specification. That's basically Spring Data JPA basically specifies what columns we want, and then JPA does its thing. Um, if we, like in this case, with a value annotation, um, we basically say uh, load the whole entity. And I'm not sure how clubs and similar uh, objects are handled uh, in that case by default. One more point are conversions. Right now, we always return either a single person or a list of person, list being the standard Java list. Um, if you, uh, and a method returning a person that actually doesn't find a person will, will return null in that case. If you don't like that, if you prefer, for example, an optional, or if you um, want immutable list and want to use waiver, you can do so. And Spring Data JPA does the necessary uh, conversions. Same applies if you want to have streams or a streamable as a return type. You can do that. And uh, Spring Data JPA, at least in many cases, will just figure it out. The variants we had so far are still all static, meaning like all the time, every time you call that method, basically the same query gets executed. But sometimes that is not what you need. You want something where query gets created dynamically. And the first step in that direction is query by example. Um, it's most useful for like search screens where you can enter some or all of the attributes of an entity and then want all entities that match these attributes one way or the other. And the way you do that in code is you create actually an instance of that entity, a person in this case, you use null everywhere where you don't care about the results, and you enter values where you do care. In this case, it's uh, the country of the address and the gender of the person. And then you create an example of, out of that and pass it on to persons find all, which... Um, I think it's part of the JPA repository interface. I might need a special interface. Is Mark still here? No. OK. Um, yeah, might, it might be that you need your repository need to implement another interface. Not completely sure about that. Um, and this will uh, query for exact matches. So in this case, it will, won't, probably won't find me in the database because if I put the country where I'm from in the database, I will write it with a capital, capital first letter and it won't find that. So in order to tune that, you can provide in, when you create your example with example of the pattern, you can provide an example matcher which uh, specifies which attributes it should use, equals or like or greater than, smaller than, um, there are different variants that you can use. Important limitation that often gets asked for, you obviously can't do a search for an interval, like date of birth between 1970 and 1980, because you only have one attribute in your pattern. You can't set two. So if you want to use intervals, you have to uh, use something different. Also, another problem with this approach is it forces you to have entities that can deal with null values in basically every place, um, which from a domain design perspective is not that nice. But on the other hand, JPA requires you to have a default constructor, so you have the problem that you have null all over the place anyway. So not perfect, but it's there. And it's useful if it uh, fits what you need. If you need even more flexibility, specifications would be the next step. Here, you definitely need a new interface, the JPA specification executor. Um, and it gives you a new find all method, which um, 
takes a specification. And a specification is a simple interface that has one method. It takes a root, a, which is a JPA data type, a criteria query, and a criteria builder, and returns a predicate, which again, sorry, which again is a JPA data type. And basically represents part of a where clause. This is all nice, except it's really ugly. I mean, if you look at it, we have all this, these parameters and stuff, and it's, I, I can't, I mean, I work with this for like, I don't know, 10 years or more, and I still can't really tell you what is a root and what is a criteria tree. These are really weird kind of objects with, in my opinion, not clear um, responsibilities. And if I pass this thing, it basically say, okay, I want something not to be true and the condition is alike and I work on the address.city attribute and compare to the city part. Oh, so I looking for people that come from, that don't come from cities that have a new in the name. So yeah, it does work, but it looks ugly. It also has another problem. Using these objects, root and criteria query, I can also add group buys, havings, I change the, can change the select list. The problem is that is really not expected by Spring Data JPA. And if you try to do that, um, all bets are off what the results are. It might actually work and you're free to do that. But if we break it in the next uh, bug fix release, uh, sorry, we don't ca uh, take complaints in that case. So this is really only for constructing where clauses. The better way which you should use if you do that more than like uh, once or twice in your application is use query DSL. Query DSL uh, hooks into your build step uh, in your build process and creates additional objects from your entities. And um, with those, you can basically do the same thing as with specifications, but in a nicer way. You again, have an uh, additional interface to implement, query DSL predicate executor. Um, the call looks exactly the same. The difference is the expression I'm getting here is a Boolean expression in this case. So a query DSL object. And we have this queue person which gets created by query DSL and allows us to really nicely query um, or construct where clauses. I think that I, I use person address.city contains ignore case city part not. Doesn't read like English, but still is, I think, easy enough to understand. Does basically the same as the previous example, but much shorter, much more concise. Sorry, I didn't understand that. No, there's no post-processing filtering. All the filtering is done by creating um, query objects uh, given to the entity manager, which sends it over to the database, returns the result, and whatever JPA um, returns. We The only post-processing is the conversion that I mentioned, so by like, the default return value is probably a list and you can turn that to a stream or streamable or something. But other than that, we don't do any uh, filtering on the client side, which would be a bad idea to do by default. If you, do, if you need to do additional filtering uh, for some reason, you have to do that on your own. Um, yeah, at that point, uh, there's time for some advertising. Uh, I already did that at the beginning. Um, people now stumble across Spring Data JDBC and get, get it confused with Spring Data JPA. The two are very much distinct. Obviously, they are both part of Spring Data. Um, they both work with the relational database. 
But with JPA, all the mapping is done by JPA and out of our control. Uh, with the Spring Data JDBC, we, the Spring Data team or the Spring Data library, actually does the mapping to the database. Um, and it tries to be much, much simpler. And as I already mentioned, I talk about that on Thursday. So either go there or catch me after the talk and we can chat. And I can tell what we are doing there. Another question. Okay, um, so the question basically uh, is you had, um, I guess, strange effects or effects that weren't uh, right away obvious to you when another application accessed the database and wrote into the database. And the, the actual question is like how and when does the repository actually um, access the entity manager? Um, and the answer is Whenever you have like one of the many variants of query methods, um, these basically all get converted into a query and the entity manager called with that. No matter if you use a JPA, JPQL query or SQL query, it just goes straight to the entity manager. If you use query derivation, we use the criteria API to create a criteria query and send that to the entity manager and then give you the result back if you do persisting, so if you call repository save, what Spring Data JPA actually do, does is calling merge on the entity manager, which is similar but different to persist. It make basically um, persist assumes that your entity is a new entity and you want to store it in the database for the first time. Merge is there for if the entity might already exist in the database, might even already exist in the entity manager, um, but you now have this detached entity, basically one that you just created, pass it to the entity manager and the entity manager will actually return um, possible the entity that it already has. So you might get back a different object and it will then track this entity and make sure that changes get eventually flushed. And the flushing, but actually happens whenever JPA thinks it's the right time to flush, which basically means if you have a brand new entity and the ID gets generated by the database, it will create an insert right away in order to get that ID. Um, otherwise, it will do nothing at the moment that you're calling it. But when the transaction ends, it will flush all the changes. Also, if you perform a query, again, no matter if you provide it manually, if you access the entity manager directly, or if you use query derivations or all the other, I mean, they will uh, basically execute a query and therefore trigger a flush by default configuration. There's a lot of configuration, obviously, that you can change, but this is other points where a flush happens and of course, before a transaction ends. Um, maybe a word about transactions. In most applications, you probably have some kind of service layer or something which is transactional and wraps uh, multiple actions in one transaction. If you don't do that, um, all the repositories are annotated as transactional. Um, so if you don't specify any transactions at all, every single call to a repository will live in its own transaction. Mm -hmm. within an transactional, and that we didn't realize that that was happening. We moved to MySQL Postgres, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden everything deadlocked in the application. And yeah. switched. And so we had to be very specific about what was transactional required versus core and all that. That's, that's another thing um, maybe to note um, what you just mentioned. If you switch from one database to another, 
basically every database out there has their um, own exact um, way of doing transactions. Some lock on read, some don't, um, and all kinds of differences. And these differences aren't fully um, equalized by JPA, which means that you, uh, although JPA gives you the impression that it's database independent, uh, you still, especially at the transaction level and uh, how locking behaves, you get differences that um, might cause problems if you, especially if you either switch a database or if you use one database for testing and try to use another one for production, don't do that. Um, there's like for a year or two, I think, there's this library out there, test containers, which basically allows you to, uh, from Java code, very easily to create any kind of um, instance wrapped in a Docker uh, container. Um, and it works great for databases in tests. So use your real database, uh, put it in a Docker container if it doesn't already exist one, and use that for testing so that you get the exact same behavior in your test as in production. Very good point. Which kind of brings us to, to troubleshooting. Um, I already mentioned, I think, that part of my job is uh, tracking Stack Overflow for Spring Data JPA questions. And um, one thing, as mentioned before, I notice is a lot of people use JPA but doesn't understand it. Um, I think there are about 100 people less now that have that problem. Um, another problem that I see is people don't understand what is Spring Data JPA and what is JPA. I hope I gave you a little impression of that. And I really urge you, when you encounter a problem, you get, don't get the results that you want. You might get an exception. Um, try to find out where the problem is. Is it in Spring Data JPA or is it in JPA or the JPA implementation? Um, uh, rules of thumbs are, if it is about, um, uh, about conversions, like you perform a query um, and the, the repository method, um, you get an exception basically saying, I can't convert this to that. That most of the time is a problem in Spring Data JPA or with the use of Spring Data JPA. If the result is wrong at all, this also might or is kind of likely a problem with Spring Data JPA. Um, either in Spring Data JPA itself or with the usage of it. Um, maybe you used a derived query and you used the uh, query name, uh, constructed the method name wrongly, um, then you get exception like that. Everything um, concerned with mapping and eager or lazy loading is almost certainly a JPA problem, not a Spring Data JPA problem, because all the mapping is done by JPA. We don't do anything with that. Um, you might think, well, this guy just wants to make his job easier. Um, well, yes, I do. Um, but it's actually in your own best interest because if I look at the Stack Overflow questions and I see a question that is ta stack, sorry, tag with Spring Data JPA, I look at it and if I see it's just a mapping problem, I just move on most of the time because I think, well, that's, I guess I might be able to help, but I have lots of people that actually need help with their Spring Data JPA problems, so I rather help them. But uh, especially if even in the title or in the question, like I have this problem with Spring Data JPA, if a Hibernate person comes along, he looks at that and says, well, that's a Spring Data JPA problem, not my problem, so you don't, you don't get an answer. So. If you're not sure if it's a JPA or Spring Data JPA question, um, make that clear in the question and use both tags. Then both of us will look at it and probably um, one is able to help you. So I think it's in your own best interest. The other thing, um, look at, of course, post your stack traces um, to Stack Overflow. Yes, all the stack traces. I know Spring stack traces can be long. And Hibernate doesn't make it better. 
Um, but also learn to look at your stack traces. There are a lot of like cryptic stuff in there, probably related to Spring proxies or Hibernate proxies that makes these confusing. But a Java exception has always a message and the Hibernate guys, the EclipseLink guys, the Spring guys, everybody tries to make these, except of these messages as good as possible. So it might very well be that the problem is very well described in that message. So read it and try to understand it. And an exception typically has another exception as a cause, and that might have another exception as the cause. And all these have messages too. So at least read all these messages. And then you might, or in many cases, might be able to resolve your problems yourself. And if not, you're in a position to ask much better question, either on Stack Overflow or wherever you like to ask your questions. That's basically it. If you want to learn more, um, there are links to the GitHub project uh, if you especially want to submit pull requests, which are always welcome although I sometimes need uh, quite some time to process them. The reference documentation, um, there's a, a GitHub repository with lots of examples for Spring Data JPA and other Spring uh, Data modules. The example code for the slides um, is in a repository on GitHub. And finally, for this specification and query DSL stuff, there's a really good example in the Spring blogs. And if you want to contact me or just make sure that I don't talk to you, uh, this information might be of value. Um, I'm Jens Schauler. I work for Pivotal in the Spring Data team. The responsibilities are Spring Data JPA, which I talked about today, Spring Data JDBC, which I will talk about on Thursday. Um, there's my email address. And if you want to chat me up, um, on the right side are topics that might be useful to get me talking. So I'll be here for the rest of the conference. So if you have questions, find me. And I think we have like, I don't know. I, I'm actually not sure when we need to finish. The next talk starts at 10 past 3. We have now 2 minutes to 3. So if there are any more questions, I guess uh, one or two we could take. Any questions? There's one. Um, there are a couple, I think there are a couple uh, databases that offer, um, that are actually no SQL databases, but offer a SQL layer and that might work if they offer a JDBC driver, but that would be a question for the specific database. Um, normally it's just for relational database. There is Spring Data for other modules, uh, or other Spring Data modules for many uh, no SQL database like uh, MongoDB, Neo4j, Cassandra, Solar, uh, many more. Um, they are not like independent that you can just swap one repository for another, but they are very similar. So you find your way around and uh, can concentrate on your business domain and the specifics of the database to use uh, that as well as possible. Mm -hmm. Make any direct JPA calls as possible. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the right thing to do or not. Um, we also have the post filter on associations. You want to touch those associations, and that's that means you can't page. Um, you can't use pageable because the code won't compile. Mm -hmm. um, so all, all sorts of things like that. Um, are there? You know, uh, maybe we're using the wrong the wrong stack for what mm -hmm. we're trying to do. I'm not sure, but um, are there are there conventions like with the transactional stuff that that the team is considering? Um, there's, um, well, the question was, are there any, any patterns or anti-patterns, uh, things that one should do or shouldn't do? Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of information about that for JPA out there, although I can't like point to a single resource. It also depends a lot on who's writing that. Like there's a, um, 
great book, High Performance with, uh, with JPA by Vladimir Alkea, which is one of the, the Hibernate uh, guys, which is great. It, as the title says, focuses on performance and actually makes suggestions that make me cringe because they are kind of the opposite of what I would do from a domain-driven design perspective. So it's really difficult to come up with a consistent uh, set. I don't think there are uh, any patterns out there like that for Spring Data or Spring Data JPA. It's actually it would be probably a good idea to do that. Um, I'm thinking about um, doing more blog posts about like looking at specific uh, technical challenges and uh, then have a blog post or that. So maybe that evolves uh, something like that. Um, one thing you mentioned, not directly man uh, accessing an entity manager. Um, I think that makes sense as a, as a baseline rule. There's actually one important feature that I would like to add maybe as a last one. When like all the methods uh, that Spring Data JPA offers aren't sufficient for you because you want to do something completely different. Maybe you want to create your query completely dynamically. You still, um, like as a last measure, have uh, what we call custom methods, where you basically provide the implementation for a method in your repository. So you can do all your custom stuff still inside the repository, but basically can do whatever you want. You can inject an entity manager there, uh, use that. You can, uh, you can inject uh, Juke, which is another library for um, accessing relational database and use that in there. Um, so all options uh, are there and we try not to get into a way. We try to make things easy that, are, that we can make easy because they are used often and are straightforward and try to get out of your way if you want to use, uh, if you want to do something that only no, you know how to do that. Um, I think, make it a wrap. Um, again, if you have more questions, I will be outside. Um, also, you can find me at the conference, probably best attack me on Twitter or something, so we can meet somewhere. Have a nice day. <laughs>